I'm uh, Rajan Menon from the Political Science Department at City College. Welcome to the inaugural Anne and Bernard Spitzer Lecture in Political Science to be delivered today by Professor Walter Russell Mead, who is the James Clark Chase Professor of American Foreign Policy and the Humanities at Bard College. When Walter and I were discussing possible topics, and he gave me several, this is a man of great range, we settled on this topic but had no idea that we would get help in terms of its immediate relevance to you from an unlikely source namely President Kim Jong-un and South Korea. Walter, I'm sure, will have some words to say about that. Let me briefly thank some people without whom this event would not have happened. To begin with, Anne and Bernard Spitzer, who are here today, who have endowed the position that I hold with great privilege at CCNY, made this lecture possible, but have done a great many other things for City College, including providing the support for this building in which we find ourselves. Mr. and Mrs. Spitzer, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your support. And with them, someone you, whose name you may have heard of, their son, Elliot Spitzer, no stranger to City College because he taught here for quite a while as Professor Spitzer. Governor, it's good to have you back. Finally, to the Colin Powell Center and its director, my colleague Vince Boudreau, to its wonderful staff, Didi Mozaleski, Wanda Mercado, Maura Christopher, Tiffany Scruggs, and to Mike Miller, who is the person who takes care of the space. Thank you all. In the publicity that you've received for this event and in the program, there is a great deal about the remarkable and extensive career of Walter Mead. And I will not bore you with all the details because there are a great many of them. You've come to hear him and not me. But let me just say that Walter Mead is regarded as one of the preeminent public intellectuals in the United States. That is a term that's vastly overused, but in Walter's case, it is wholly justified, I think for the following reasons. He has an uncanny ability to cross boundaries, boundaries of all sorts, chronological, intellectual, disciplinary, and ideological. Second, he writes luminous prose. I, I really recommend that those of you who just like the pleasure of reading good prose read his work and speaks with great force and eloquence on things that matter to the American public. This is not a man who engages in navel gazing. For instance, one of the things that Walter has been writing on, but will not speak on today, I assume, is the future of the welfare state in liberal democracies, an issue which in this country and in Europe we're grappling with significantly. Finally, I've known Walter for about 10 years. And I have yet been able to figure out whether he is a man of the right, a man of the center, a man of the left. He's very difficult to classify ideologically. So you're in for a treat. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Walter Russell Mead, who will speak on America's Asia pivot at a time of upheaval. Walter, good to have you here. You know, it's very nice to go out and make a, give a talk and you hear this terrific introduction, but then you realize everybody's going to be disappointed because you can't live up to it. So I'm sorry if I'm not going to be as eloquent or whatever as has been, uh, been advertised, but I'd very much like to thank the Spitzer family for making this event possible and to the department for inviting me. It's a real honor to be at a uh, a college which has really trained so many of the most important and interesting thinkers and writers in American history and which maintains an incredible commitment to service of the community uh, and where the best and the brightest of New York City, 
wherever they or their families come from, whatever's in the past, really have the chance to get the tools that will allow a new generation to shape a new future. So this is, this is an institution whose mission I believe in and whose students and whose faculty I really admire and look up to. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk today about the biggest thing that's happening in American foreign policy right now. And it's a complicated thing, and it's one, oddly, that both parties agree on. Uh, you, you wouldn't find in a group of Republicans or a group of Democrats a lot of discussion about whether or not America ought to be focusing more on Asia at the core of our foreign policy. And to a surprising degree, when you hear people from the Bush administration and people from the Obama administration arguing about the policy, one of the real arguments the Bush people are saying is you're not giving us credit, enough credit, for setting the lines along which you're traveling now. In other words, there really is a kind of a bipartisanship about American policy in Asia which at a time of polarization in the country as a whole is remarkable and from my point of view a little cheering. Can everybody hear me with the... Is this any better? Okay. I'll try to keep it like this. Uh, and yet, even though there's a lot of bipartisan consensus that this is the thing that we should be doing and that this is more or less the way we should be doing it, actually, things are not going particularly well in Asia at the moment. As some of you may have noticed, there's been a lot of uh, instability in Asia. This young Kim Jong-un is making some interesting remarks. And we've seen China and Japan uh, coming closer to a clash than many people have seen in a while. In fact, I've heard in the last three months some very serious and well-respected people, the kind who are not given to alarmism and so on, but I've heard people like this say in private they are actually worried about the prospect of war in Asia in the next year. And they would, some of them mention a Chinese and Japanese war, some of them mention it happening in Korea. But this is a level of concern that I find uh, new in Asia and quite troubling. So in classical American fashion, when we've actually got a bipartisan foreign policy, it turns out to be generating or at least not avoiding very serious crises. Well. What do we mean, first of all, by pivot to Asia or pivot to the Pacific? You know, we throw these geographical terms around, but in fact, these days, when you hear American diplomats talking, of, or in strategic planners talking about Asia, they're not talking about East Asia, they're, they're not talking about all of Asia. They sort of are basically talking about everything from Pakistan to the Russian Far East and down to Australia. So it's, you know, that doesn't actually correspond to any, any uh, entity recognized by geographers. It's what people used to call South Asia plus what people used to call East Asia. And increasingly, our foreign policy toward all of these countries is being formed and thought about as a unit rather than as two completely different theaters of the world, which would have been true even five or six years ago. That's likely to continue, I think. The big question in some ways is, will it, this, this definition excludes West Asia. That is to say, Iran, Pakistan's neighbor. Uh, not to mention Syria, Iraq, and so on, uh, will we succeed, in a sense, in keeping our Asia policy and our Middle Eastern policy distinct? Good question. For countries like India, 
actually. India is not interested in the same sort of geographical and cultural boundaries that we've seen. And for India, Iran and Pakistan on one side are at least as interesting and important as China on the other. So I think we can go on expecting these culturally constructed geographical categories to be challenged by geopolitics. Well, why is this shift, this pivot to Asia, so, um, so commonly accepted in American foreign policy? Well, they're the obvious reasons. You know, it, it's home to more than half the population of the world. Um, very soon, three of the five largest economies will, uh, in the world will be in this region. Um, in terms of the growth in America's trade, in terms of our sources of immigration, Asia is the future. By the way, in the three years ago, Asia passed Latin America and the Caribbean as the largest source of immigrants to the United States. That's something a lot of people haven't yet uh, processed, but it's very much the case. And if this continues, and we may well expect it to, we could see uh, people from different Asian countries becoming much more important in American politics and American culture and the economy in the next 10 years. Um, so there are all of those reasons, and they're all very good reasons, but they're not the only reason. I think the key why Asia is becoming so important to so many people in the United States is that if you think about where the world is going, the difference between if everything goes well in Asia and everything goes badly in Asia, that the size of that difference and the importance of that difference is bigger than the difference between sort of any kind of likely good or likely bad scenario outcome anywhere in the world. That is, we could imagine things going badly in Europe. In fact, they're going quite badly right now. And we could imagine that the euro melts down and there's some kind of economic crisis that plunges us <coughs> into a depression. That's bad, but it's not the end of the world and it's probably not reopening the era of great wars in Europe. Um, the same thing is true in Latin America from the standpoint of American interests. The, the difference between the sort of best likely outcome and worst likely outcome is not that large. Um, but in Asia, if everything goes well in this region of the world I've been describing, it means that for Americans and for Asians and probably for everybody in the world, the 21st century will be <coughs> the most peaceful and the most prosperous century in that, that, our, that humanity knows anything about. That we will continue to see the hundreds of millions and billions of people leaving poverty in Asia itself. We could well see countries like China, Japan, India, Indonesia, so many others forming the kind of deep peace among themselves that we've seen develop in Europe after the Second World War. Um, <coughs> the prosperity and the commerce that would flow in and out of this region of the world would be immense. In Africa, in Africa and in Latin America, people would benefit enormously, have already benefited from the stimulus that Asia's growth has brought to those parts of the world. So, and it's, it's not unrealistic to think about the possibility of Asia becoming as prosperous and peaceful as Europe, continuing to transform the development high horizons of the world. And I could also say that from an environmental point of view, a developing Asia that's increasingly affluent is going to be an Asia that can clean up pollution, that can move away from expensive and unsustainable forms of energy use and production to longer term better strategies. From every point of view, a developing Asia in the 21st century is an immensely positive phenomenon. That's the upside but think about the downside. 
We've seen in the last few months, we've seen the Japanese and Chinese in these bitter, bitter disputes over territory. We've seen on both sides nationalist public opinion, and I'm not kidding you, even threatening war over these islands. There are deep religious, ethnic, historical, nationalist tensions across Asia. Uh, those of you who follow this know that in Burma, we've seen uh, riots against the Muslim minority in Burma breaking out and people being expelled from their homes. Uh, Southeast Asia could become a sort of a cauldron in all kinds of ways. Um, India, Pakistan, if all of this went wrong, we could see in a world in the 21st century that was as as bad as the worst of the 20th century, with mass killings, with the kind of ruthless ideal ideologies and dictatorships that we saw in, in, in Europe in the past. This could be a hellish century, and conceivably even humanity's final century if things go badly in Asia. So, if you want to know what kind of century the 21st century is going to be, watch Asia. And if you want to affect the kind of century that the 21st century is going to be, try to do what you can to promote the positive scenario in Asia of a region that's rising, that's developing, that's becoming more prosperous, more integrated, more peaceful. And that fundamentally is why the American pivot to Asia is one that has people agreeing on its importance across the political spectrum in the United States. The difference between a best case scenario in Asia and a worst case scenario in Asia is so immense and so consequential that just about anybody who thinks about it immediately comes to the conclusion that, okay, we need to be doing what we can, which may be little or it may be a lot, but we need to be doing what we can to promote the benign scenario there. Okay, so if that's what we're gonna try to do, what are our chances? What are the problems? What are the opportunities? Is, is there anything really we can do? Um, and I guess <coughs> at, at heart, I'm an optimist not only about Asia, but at about America's ability to play a constructive role in the development of Asia. Um, and why is that? You hear a lot of people today, often people who are grounded in various forms of IR theory, talking about the inevitable clash between the United States and China. You know, the theory would sort of say that a rising hegemon, a rising great power, is going to challenge the reigning great power. And so that as China comes up, the United States will try to resist that, China will push back, and sooner or later something will go wrong and there will be a big explosion. It's what a lot of international relations theorists would say. And I can't deny that there's a real possibility of that, and very serious people both in China and in the United States We'll talk about this prospect quite openly and realistically in both countries. Um, and so we have to make our policy knowing that there are people in China, some of them quite powerful, who believe that war between us sooner or later is inevitable. And they have to make policy over there knowing that there are people among us who believe that war between us is inevitable sooner or later. Obviously, this complicates the policymaking business. As I think about this situation, though, it seems to me actually that the, that, that the people who see the inevitable clash have got a few things wrong. 
the kind of map of the, the template, the pattern that they're looking at when they look at this is fundamentally the conflict between Germany and Great Britain that led to World War I. And their idea is kind of 2013 is a lot like 1913. And the role of Germany is being played by China. And the role of Great Britain is being played by the United States. And this is the way a lot of even quite serious people, this is the mental toolkit they bring to analyze the rise of China and the American response. I actually think there's a big difference between China today and Germany in 1913 that really matters from the standpoint of this scenario. Look at Europe in 1913. I know all of you undergrads especially spend a lot of time thinking about Europe 100 years ago, but let's try, okay? Um, and okay, we see Germany, definitely. Germany's a rising power, getting stronger every year, better technology, bigger population. They're really on a roll, all right? You know, and then we've got France. France is worried. France sees every year it's falling behind Germany. Its population is stagnating. Its, its technology is falling behind the rest of the world, all right? What do we see in Russia? They've just lost that war to Japan in the Pacific. They've had riots. They had the, the St. Petersburg, the first Russian revolution. They're worried, will we manage? Everyone around the Tsar is worried about the future of the Russian state. They're in decline, and they feel it. Austria-Hungary, we, you know, we don't even think of that as one country today. But back then it was. However, they realized they were not going to stay one country for long. They could feel the nationalism moving to break up what was left of the Habsburg kingdom. They were in decline. The Ottoman Empire, which had once been the most powerful state in Europe, had been falling apart, shedding territory, being driven out of the Balkans. The Ottomans were in decline. And Italy, well, it was Italy, uh, and uh, s establishing some of the great traditions of statesmanship that Italy has followed to this present day. Uh, and okay, so you have a rising nation in a continent of decline, which means the balance of power in Europe is getting less stable every year as Germany rises and the possible coalitions against it are getting weaker. It's an unstable situation. What do we see when we look at Asia? Yes, China is rising. Economy is growing, not quite as fast now as it was a couple of years ago, but it's growing. The technology is developing. Society is becoming richer and more complex. Wonderful things are happening everywhere you look. But, you know, what's around China? Well, there's Vietnam, which is a rising country, developing, growing rapidly. There's Korea. There's Japan, which, while it isn't rising, seems to be showing a lot of life and is still the third largest economy in the world. And there's India. You know, if there's going to be superpowers in Asia with more than a billion people in them and have nuclear weapons, from the standpoint of the balance of power, it's a lot better that there's two of them than just one. So in fact, when we look at Asia, we see a region of rising powers. And we also see that these other Asian powers, Vietnam, Australia, Indonesia, India, Japan have no intention of being overshadowed by China. So we have a fundamentally different situation in Asia today than people faced in Europe a hundred years ago. And potentially what we have here is a stable balance of power. If you think about the big three countries in Asia, 
India, China, Japan in terms of power and wealth, all right, it's likely that over time any two of them could combine to balance the third. And that's especially true if all the little ones, the, and some of them are not little, Indonesia's got a population almost the size of the United States, and Australia has a tremendous GDP with a lot of resources and a lot of financial power. If the little countries are in on it too, then it's very unlikely that China is going to be able to do in Asia what Germany tried to do in Europe. And so if the road to hegemony, the door to hegemony is sort of blocked, there's a real hope that China would choose, would realize that the best course for China is to pursue a peaceful integration in Europe. In, a sense, in essence, to do what Germany has done in Europe after 1945 without having to go through those two world wars as the first step. That's the hope. There's no guarantee that this could happen. You know, we don't have any, you know, money back if not satisfied promises about the 21st century. But it's a reasonable hope. And this is the way a lot of Americans and a lot of people in the region, including a good number of people in China, think about what is the road to the future. Um, that America, with these other countries, would not contain China, but rather work with China to create a peaceful and integrated Asia in which China, as much as any other country, would have the ability to become rich, powerful, and respected in the same way that Germany has gotten richer and gotten more respected by cooperating with its European neighbors than it did back when it was trying to conquer them. That is the secret American plan for Asia. And I think of it in some ways as kind of the universal sunshine plan. We want every country in Asia to be richer happier, safer, and more secure. We want them all to do well, because when they are all doing well, including China, then the peace of the region is the most stable. There's the most hope for the future, and it's best for us. So, that's our policy. Now, the question is, you know, why is it so hard? Uh, why is, why, since we pivoted to Asia, why have things gotten so difficult? What could go wrong? I mean, this is, seems so obvious. It seems like such a win, 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 win for everybody. You know, why do you even have to work at this outcome? Well, there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of things that, there are a lot of obstructions in the path or a lot of things that could go wrong that would make this vision less attainable. Um, there's first of all the question, there, there are many questions about China. Uh, you know, China's government, will it be stable in its current form? Will the one party system continue to be able to to sustain the kind of economic development? Will it be able to solve social problems like pollution or greater inequality or so on? Or will the discontent sort of boil over? And obviously, if a country as important as China is changing direction or is struggling internally, a lot of things could happen. One thing that historically does happen is when leaders of a country feel their hold on power is weak, there's a tendency to turn to very radical nationalism as a way to maintain your public support. Um, and there are signs that to some degree this is happening. Uh, not all the way, but, but there are some alarming signs that very, very ultra-nationalist groups in China are having a little bit more public space to speak. 
and are also having more impact on public opinion. So this is a problem. Um, there, are, there are sort of linguistic differences. For one thing, the word, when we use the word contain, it often gets translated in, into Chinese, into Mandarin, I'm told, by a word that means throttle. And so it seems like, a, you know, the, the Chinese debate is, we think the debate is, is America trying to contain China and should we? And China's debate is, is America trying to strangle China? All right, that's pretty sharp. Um, and there are other places where public opinion, not just in China, can, can make things difficult. Most people in China are pretty convinced that Tibet is part of China and should stay part of China, come what may. And all those Buddhists burning themselves up and so on. Of course, first, many, of them, many Chinese have never heard about it. But in the second place, they're just hateful agitators and troublemakers. And we, you know, and there's a tremendous resentment if outsiders try to tell them what to do. On the, in the outside world, on the other hand, there's a lot of concern about that. So there are all kinds of issues that will be difficult to adjust and to make work. Um, there are other questions outside of China. You know, there's the question, there, there are a lot of questions over India's political and economic future. India's economic growth in the last year has been decelerating. And there are real questions as to whether India's growth level, which has never been as high as China, the question is, can India stay in China's league? Is a question. If India can't, then the whole question of whether there's a natural balance of power in Asia has to be re-examined. And if that has to be re-examined, you have to ask yourself again, well, what are the chances of the good scenario in Asia, and how much should we be worried about the possible bad ones? And for India, you know, we'd like to say, well, just change a few economic policies and things will get better. But India is a very complicated place. How many people here have traveled to India or are from India? We have a few. So you guys will know what I'm talking about. India is one of the few places in the world that is even more complicated and hard to, hard to understand than the United States. You know, it not only has many more people than we do, it has many more kinds of people at many more levels of development and with many different sort of cultural and social histories and many different issues. It is very hard for India to move quickly. And as India becomes a more democratic society, that is to say people are you know, less are voting the way their feudal landlords tell them to vote and are voting more the way they want to vote, it actually is harder to have an Indian government in Delhi that can make decisions about economic policy. There's so many people in India, so many political parties, so many minority coalitions that can say, no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. And so it, it, it is becoming in some ways progressively harder for Indian leaders to lead. And one of the things that we know about rapid economic development is that strong leadership is important. In India's case, one of the big problems is infrastructure. How many people here have been to China? Okay, quite a few here too. But if you've been to China, you know the infrastructure is, is pretty good, at least a lot of it is. I was once in Shanghai and a friend in Shanghai said, oh, you've got to come out and see our new airport. I thought, my God, no one in America would ever say that. Um, but he went out and very proudly showed me this amazing, glittering, really very impressive airport. Um, monorails, you name it, they've got it. India has a really hard time getting even basic infrastructure done. And so this may choke its economic growth. We don't know the answers. The 21st century is going to be new. We do not know what the future holds. And there's a question mark over India's future. There's some other question marks 
the India-Pakistan standoff, um, the possibility that terrorist attacks from Pakistan in India might force India into a military response, and that could go nuclear. It really could. Colin Powell, I guess who uh, is associated with this center here, uh, talks about how in that one of the things he was proudest of in his public service was helping to stop what he believed otherwise would have been a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. It's really possible. And that, of course, also means that American foreign policy has to pay attention to that and think about that and do what we can, if there is anything, to lessen those risks. We also have the question of Japan. Japan is a mysterious place, even to the Japanese. And it seems to have moved very hard to the right in the last few years. Whereas five years ago, people in Japan were actually debating whether they could be more neutral between America and China and loosen their security relationship with the United States. Today, the talk in Japan is about rebuilding the Japanese armed forces, deepening the strategic relationship with the United States. It's, it's a big change. Will it last, and how far will it go? One answer is, you know, when we're sitting over here and reading all that news about North Korea and Kim Jong-un's th threats and so on, we have a certain tendency to kind of, you know, laugh. Um, uh, sometimes I, I, I've called North Korea part of the axis of ankle biters. You know, countries that, that would love to do a lot of damage, but really they can just sort of bite you on the ankle. Um, and just shake them off, shake them off. Well, that may be how North Korea looks to the United States. It is not how North Korea looks at Japan because it wouldn't really take all that many nuclear weapons and not even very good ones to do a lot, make a lot of destruction in Tokyo. And so people in Japan in some ways are having the shocking experience that Americans had say during the Cuba Missile Crisis or other times when we were really afraid that we might get bombed by the Soviet Union. The, you have a lot of people now in Japan who are really afraid. And when people are afraid, they can do unusual things. And so we're seeing Japan is now making security policy in a very different mood. And there have actually been cases where the Obama administration has been saying to the Japanese, calm down. Please don't be so hot-headed. The idea that the Americans would be trying to pull the Japanese back from a confrontational foreign policy, if you had grown up you know, any time in the last 50 years, you would find that like from science fiction. But it's happening more strange things will be happening in Asia in the 21st century. Um, then there are a couple of landmines in Asia. I've talked about the three big countries, but there's always that Taiwan-China dispute. Fortunately, for the last 10 years, the, the dispute between China and Taiwan has been handled better on both sides. Um, and part of that is, frankly, because the Americans really pushed on both sides trade. We believed that having Taiwan invest in China and seeing more economic integration between the mainland and Taiwan would reduce the chance of military conflict between the two. Every time a politician in Taiwan now wants to do something that would make China mad, all these Taiwanese business people come into his office and say, are you insane? Do you realize, you know, I have $15 billion of investments in Fujian and you are going to cause a stupid crisis? But the same thing also happens in the mainland. Do you realize what would happen if we closed, if those Taiwanese plants closed down and we, what our unemployment would be? Do you have any idea? Who would pay their wages? if you start this crisis? 
Do you really want to be confronting half a million workers going down Main Street angry at you? I don't think you do. So both sides have incentives now to try to manage their conflict in a more positive way. Unfortunately, we don't have anything like that going on in North Korea. And so while the Taiwanese situation has been getting better, the North Korean situation, if anything, has been getting worse. I'll ask again, how many of you have been to North Korea? Okay, I think I might be the only one that's been to North Korea here. Um, and it's a trip. Uh, it's, uh, it's everything you've heard. I think one of the most striking things I saw in North Korea, I was standing on the main street of Pyongyang, and you, they were having one of their periodic gasoline shortages because, as you may have heard, their economy doesn't work very well. And uh, so there was not a single car or truck or bus to be seen from the center of town way out to the mountains beyond. And the air was very clear because there weren't any factors. I mean, nothing was being produced. Um, but what they had at every intersection were these traffic police women wearing white gloves and uniforms. And they were doing a little ballet at each corner directing the non-existent traffic. Okay? Fun, huh? Um, and later on, I asked one of the, Nor this was during one of their famines, and I asked uh, my North Korean guide and minder, you know, uh, I said, I see that everyone is walking to work. Uh, no, one, no buses, no one is using public transportation. He said, yes. He says, in North Korea, people are very fitness conscious. And I thought, great, they don't want to gain too much weight during the famine. Um, but anyway, that's, you know, so that is a very different thing. We don't understand why they're making the decisions that they do. I've spent some time talking to China's North Korea experts. They don't understand. I mean, one of them said to me at a, at a meeting, he says, look, he says, you've got to understand, we think about them pretty much the same way you do. We see the same thing that you see. But we don't think they're going to fall quickly. That's the difference, the Chinese said, between what they perceive as the American point of view and what they see as the Chinese point of view. Who knows? But right now, North Korea in some ways is a bigger headache for China than it is for the United States because when North Korea makes all these threats, the Chinese can watch everybody in the region drawing two conclusions. One, China doesn't have any power. Because if big old China can't make North Korea behave, then China clearly is not, you know, it, the Chinese are not as strong as they think they are. But the other thing everybody thinks is, let's stay very close to the United States. Because in South Korea and Japan, they think, you know, there's really only one hope here. The Chinese can't help us, and if something goes wrong, the Americans are the only people we can call. So North Korea is actually strengthening America's alliance in, network in the region, and it's undermining China's. Um, and by the way, if North Korea keeps its nuclear weapon, and this is something that, again, you can talk about this with Chinese officials and they see it too. The most likely consequence is that ultimately other countries in the region will get nuclear weapons. That the South Koreans are not going to sit there forever with these threats being hurled at them every day without wanting a nuclear weapon of their own. And also the Japanese can live with being non-nuclear with China under the American umbrella, but if, if one Korea and maybe two Koreas are going to have nuclear weapons, Japan's calculation changes. And the thing that worries a lot of people in China is if there's going to be a nuclear weapons bazaar in the East Pacific, Taiwan is certainly going to get in line for one too. So the Chinese do not want this proliferation. They do not want North Korea to have a nuclear weapon, but they don't know what to do about it, and we don't really have much to suggest. That's where we are there.
Well, I could go on, but I think I'm going to leave the, my remarks here and uh, with one final point and let you, so that you guys can ask some questions and we can have some discussion. But I think the, the big problem America has in the region, right, or with our foreign policy overall right now, and not just in the region, but in a sense globally, is that when the Obama administration announced the pivot to Asia, they believed at that time, this would have been a year, year and a half ago, it looked like the Middle East was calming down. The war had, you know, had wound down in Iraq. The Syria thing was not a big deal. Um, there was a lot more hope then than now. I think that there'd be a negotiated so solution with Iran. Libya hadn't happened. So there was sort of, a, you know, we weren't thinking about building new drone bases in Mali and these, uh, you know, or Niger and these other places and so on. So there was a sense that we were moving out of the Middle East. And so that we could then add a little bit to our forces in Asia, even as we were overall reducing the military budget in a pretty substantial way. But it's just two things have happened that have made that scenario harder. One is that it's clear that, that the administration has not, let's say, been able to scrape the Middle East off its shoes and get out. That in some ways we're being pulled back in. You see the pressure for the U.S. to start intervening in Syria seems to be growing rather than shrinking. The Iranian confrontation is getting sharper. Uh, Obama has realized that if he's going to make any progress on peace with the Palestinians, he actually has to work with the Israelis, and that creates a whole set of other difficulties for him and for the policy. So we're more committed than we thought over there. But on the other hand, over in Asia, as we were beginning to announce the pivot and move some forces in there, it was during the Chinese political transition. And it turned out to be a much more difficult political transition than anybody thought. Remember the Bo Xilai scandal and that whole series of things in China. Um, and it was in many ways the biggest internal political crisis the Chinese had faced since the time of the Cultural Revolution. And it was also coming at a time where economic growth is slowing in China. And this actually made the leadership much less willing and able to step on nationalist agitation in China. So there was a little bit more room for the stuff on the, on the eight islands in the, South, in the South China Sea and so on. The government wasn't really able, didn't feel able to rein that stuff in. And so things have escalated now in the Pacific and they're hotter in the Middle East and the Obama administration, in a sense, is stuck with one set of policies and then another set of budget assumptions, and they don't match, and it's not quite clear what the best way is to, to bring these realities together. And I'm not saying this in some like, to, you know, to attack the administration or that sort of thing. I think it's just no one can see into the future. No one has a crystal ball. And this is kind of how things have worked out. So it's, it's a little tricky and difficult right now. Anyway, that's kind of a big overview of American policy in the Pacific. I hope it was helpful. So we are going to move to Q&A. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? No. How about now? Yeah. Uh, we're going to move to Q&A. There is a roving microphone. Ask a question. Do not make a statement. Please relinquish the microphone. This event is being podcast, and your misbehavior will be etched in posterity if you don't uh, relinquish the microphone. I've also um, been asked to tell you, by the way, and I know nothing about Twitter, but apparently this is being live tweeted, and the hashtag, take that for what you will, is RWMead. Now, while your brain cells are working, I'd like to ask the first question by stealing the podium. Uh, Walter, you've talked about two emerging powers in Asia, India and China. 
And let's take two scenarios. One is that India makes it. Ramshackle, unmanageable. It manages to combine democracy and economic development. Good things happen, infrastructure is fixed, living standards rise, and Asians conclude that this is the model that we ought to follow. It is possible to have economic growth in a democratic system. It has huge effects on Asia, it seems to me. But if India does make it and become more powerful, can there be a stable balance of power between two states that have very little in common, have a territorial dispute that's unresolved, and a cultural and political system that is very, very different? Let's take the other scenario, that India does not make it. Not that it falls apart, but it reverts to what Jagdish Bhagwati used to call the Hindu rate of growth, 2%, 1.5%. And people begin to ask questions about what is the appropriate model for economic growth? Is it some variation of the Chinese model? Now, it's not that everybody will emulate China because each country in Asia is different. But there will be some message sent about how one makes it, so to speak, in the 21st century. Could you uh, give us your thoughts on that? Well, one thing to realize is that the wealthiest country in Japan, in, in Asia, is Japan. So that you know, there already is a certain association of democracy with wealth, and you can look at what's happened in Korea and in Taiwan where these, both of these places actually industrialized and began to develop under pretty authoritarian regimes. But as they became more affluent, uh, there was much more f public feeling that they wanted a more democratic structure. And I think among the elite, there was more of a sense that democracy was a luxury which we could now afford. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful idea inside China itself that when, when I talk to angry students in China who want change to come very fast, you know, they'll, I say, well, what do you want? And they want China to be more like Europe, more democratic, and so on and so forth. How fast do you want it? Five years, 10 years. Then you talk to the middle-aged bureaucrats in the party apparatus, and you say, what do you want? And they say, well, we want China to be more like Europe, more richer, better developed, more open. I said, well, how fast do you want it? And they say, you know, 50 years is probably as fast as we could do it. So in China, there's not a huge ideological debate among a lot of people over where they want to go. But there's a lot of debate over how. And you have to remember that a lot of the older people in China lived through the Cultural Revolution, which was young students wanting to get to democracy very quickly through direct action, as that's remembered by Chinese. So I guess what I'm saying is to some degree that, that democracy in Asia doesn't simply depend on Indian success, though that would help, but also that China doesn't really see itself as bearing the torch of Marxism for everybody forever. Uh, it more says, this is the right strategy for us. Um, and on that basis, there may be less conflict. One can at least hope so. Bruce. Chinese officials and academics began talking about a pivot towards the Americas, uh, suggested beefing up Brazil, Mexico, Argentina to balance the power of the United States, establish bases in the Caribbean. There'd obviously be an uproar. So why shouldn't China uh, be very nervous and very resentful of the United States considering itself to be an Asian power and wanting to pivot towards them balancing their power in the same way that you've been discussing? Well, I think the reason is the United States is not really looking to open new bases or, or, you know, we're not sort of looking to do anything fundamentally different than what we've been doing. And it was interesting, the one new U.S. deployment, serious U.S. deployment that, w that was announced as part of the pivot was in Perth, Australia, which is about as far from the Chinese mainland as you can get. Uh, 
2,500 very lucky Marines are going to be spending time in Perth. Uh, I would suggest to the good people of Perth, it's time to lock up your, your kids. But, um, you know, the nightlife in Perth is going to be more interesting. But um, also, from a Chinese point of view, if you look at it, a lot of what's happening is that U.S. troops are being positioned out of Japan and Korea and moved more southeast. So it's not like we're sort of crossing 10,000 miles to suddenly be in your face. I think in these ways it's kind of calibrated. It's just like, you know, the French, you could argue the French have a base in Martinique, but somehow we are not worried. Um, it's, so I think it's the difference between a long established reality that's being retweaked and a radical innovation. Hassan, I see you. <laughs> I think ASEAN has already played a very important role and has even more to do in the future. Um, and ASEAN, one of the things that ASEAN does very effectively, for those of you who don't know, ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And it includes countries like, it was basically Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, sort of were the core of it, but it's kind of expanded into Southeast Asia and, and, and a bit around. Um, and it's, it has become a key negotiating focus. In fact, really good news, recently China has agreed to discuss the questions of the South China Sea with ASEAN, which is really a very important and positive step forward. Um, and arguably, next to the European Union, ASEAN is the most effective international, multinational organization around today. I think we're going to see more. Um, and I think India is taking a greater interest in ASEAN and China is taking a greater interest in ASEAN. So I'm, I'm quite opt I'm, I, if ASEAN were a stock, I would be buying it. Governor Spitzer. Thank you. I guess I am always a bit hesitant when I see beautiful metaphors coming out of government and the notion of a pivot is such a metaphor. But I have a hard time actually discerning what the change has been in our policies. Obviously, we are more integrated than we used to be with Asia by dint of economic forces. But what are the actual shifts in our policy that one can look at to see an actual pivot since the metaphor was first used one or two years ago? Uh, no, I think actually what, that's actually been quite small. A few mostly naval forces repositioning of some Marines. But what it does is it, it has sort of, it, like a lot of these labels do, it captures the imagination because it describes something bigger. Arguably, the foundation of the pivot to Asia is the U.S.-India rapprochement that began uh, really late in the Clinton years, really picked up in the Bush years, um, there was the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Agreement that was passed by bipartisan majority uh, at the end of the Bush administration. So it's, it, it's, in, in some ways, it's been the deepening of the U.S.-India relationship and the U.S. seeing India in an Asian context and not merely a South Asian context. While at the same time, Japan-India relations have also grown stronger in some interesting ways. So there has been a change, but I agree the pivot is sort of a, you know, it's just a useful shorthand that people use. Mira. Tiffany. I think we're going to go there first and then come to him. Interacting and intersecting with what you hope are the stabilizing economic developments. 
I'm thinking about how the Syrian resistance has now part of them have an Al-Qaeda connection. Part of them are extremely are extremists in terms of their religion, who they'll talk to and, and who will allow into their groups. How do you see that acting and, and, and interfacing with what you hope are the are the more benign developments? Well, of course, if I knew that, I would be omniscient and. Uh, you know, but uh, I think what we can say is that there's a big gap in China right now between people who are in the kind of echelons of leadership, most of whom study abroad and a large chunk of those people in the United States. If I go to the Chinese foreign ministry and sit and talk with various people there, you know, they'll be asking me whether I think Mearsheimer's theories or Walt or whatever is the best for X. And they're talking the same academic language and, and range of historical references that we would use. But you'll find people who uh, are outside that magic bubble, who don't speak foreign languages, who've never been abroad, maybe don't know anybody who's ever been abroad, and they come at these questions in very different ways. Uh, remember once I was uh, with a group, this was, I don't know if you guys, some of you might be old enough to remember when the US accidentally bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And at that time, no one would believe, in China really believed it was an accident. Um, so I remember I was talking to, to this guy who was driving uh, the group of Chinese people and me around and, and at lunch, I said, so what, what question, we had an interpreter, what question do you want to ask me? Because these other people have been asking all their questions. He said, why did you bomb our embassy? I think after the Iraq war, they, they have an easier time understanding that we do things by mistake sometimes. But back then, they didn't. And so they, um, there was a you know, a sense of anger, of American plotting, of outraged nationality, nationalism. How do these forces integrate? To some degree, it's not so much about foreign policy, it's will Chinese society cohere? Will the center hold in China? Um, and one hopes that it does for all kinds of reasons. But there are problems. Um, the biggest one, I think, is that um, China is trying to become America in the 1950s. That is to say, you know, where everybody with the equivalent of a high school diploma can have a factory job that will give them a middle class standard of living. It ain't going to happen. Uh, partly because when wages rise in China, industry will move to Bangladesh or other cheaper locations but also because when wages rise, there's now all this automated technology that can uh, you know, replace workers with machinery. And it's much easier to buy something off the shelf than it is to develop it from scratch. So I actually think the transition in China to a stable middle class society is going to be harder than a lot of people think, and that that will have repercussions in Chinese politics and Chinese foreign policy. What they'll be, I don't know, and how severe it will be, I don't know. But I think it is, we should not be like the people who just sort of project Chinese growth and income growth forever into the sky. Uh, back 30 years ago when everybody was talking about how Japan was gonna conquer the world and you know, what pe everything people say about China today, they were saying about Japan in 1980. And I remember a friend saying, you gotta watch these projections. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, he says, if you, if you just project out the trends, if you look at population, the Japanese will go extinct in the year 3020 AD. The last Jap living Japanese will die. Also, she'll be a woman, she'll be 140 years old, and she will have a trade surplus of $8 trillion with the United States. Um, you can't project all these trends out. So the future, your generation is going to have very interesting careers. Don't worry, we are not going to solve all the world's problems before you are senior enough to really get your hands on them. 
Sorry, we missed you earlier, please. Well, again, the Chinese, it, it, it's very interesting to talk to Chinese officials because when it gets down to the end of the day, uh, the Chinese understand that if the American forces left Japan, Japan would go nuclear very quickly. And they don't like that. They don't think that Asia would be safer. Because again, as the South Koreans would go nuclear, the Taiwanese would go nuclear, it would be a mess, and they would have all the disputes they have now. So that American forces in Asia actually make Asia a more, it's, it's a little bit like our forces in Germany, you know, in Europe. We're not there, we're not in Europe to fight a war, and we haven't been for a very long time. But the existence of those American forces makes it easier for the other European countries to sort of trust each other a little bit more. And so I would say that the, you know, it's true if the American forces left Asia, these Asian countries have the, the technological capability to find out ways to defend themselves. I don't think we would be safer if that happened. I don't think they would be safer if that happened. So. That's, that's basically the argument for doing what we're doing. And if you talk to people in Asia, you'll find very few people disagree with, with what I've just said. This is, this is something you'll hear in China as well as in other countries. So we've got time for a couple of more. There's one, well, three more. It's one there, one there, and one there. Please, you first. And I was wondering if their influence in Pakistan could end up being a ticking time bomb, like you said, for stability in Asia. Yeah, uh, yeah Pakistan is, again, anybody here been to Pakistan? All right. Okay, so I'm not alone in, in Pakistan uh, knowledge. Pakistan is, a con is one of the most complicated places around. And there are a lot of issues in Pakistan. We tend to think from a West American perspective almost entirely in terms of religious radicalism and terror as, you know, that's the thing to worry about. The rest of it we don't pay much attention to. But Pakistan is actually full of all kinds of ethnic and tribal uh, differences. And one of the things that's been happening is that people from the Northwest Frontier area uh, I can never remember how to pronounce it. It has a new name now, but I can't pronounce it yet. I'm working on that. Um, Pakhtunwa. Um, it is, uh, um, there's a lot of immigrants moving from there into the rest of the country. And these are places that have more connection culturally, religiously, and in other ways with Afghanistan, but also there's a lot of tension between them and the people where they're moving. So there's that issue. And you also have the thing that we, tend, we hear the word Taliban and we think, okay, religious fanatical terror organization, but one can also think at least a part of it as mafia, kidnapping for hire, rackets, they, you know, they basically, like a, like a rackets organization, they have turf in a city, that kind of thing. So we should not let words like Taliban uh, blind us to very complicated things. This Taliban isn't like that Taliban, just like, you know, Tony Soprano isn't the same as the Russian mafia or whatever. But having said all that, things are not getting better in Pakistan. And the people who want to push Pakistan in a more secular, or let's just say liberal, neutral kind of way, 
are, are on the defensive, are often afraid to speak out. The governor who spoke up against the blasphemy laws was assassinated. Um, it's not good. And yes, it could cause wider problems in India. And in India itself, there's an unfortunate tendency toward rising sectarian uh, problems too. India has a very substantial Muslim minority and it's not always and everywhere a completely happy relationship. So it's tricky and getting trickier. Yes, please. Okay. Well, you know, Russia and China have a very complicated relationship, and uh, um, Russians in general are much more afraid of China than Americans are. Uh, that's possibly because they have a very large land, land boundary with China, which we don't, and also possibly because in the last 25 years, the Chinese have been making huge leaps, and the Russians have not been. And the Russians, um, if you go to Vladivostok, which is the big Russian city in the Far East, and you talk to Russians there, they're afraid that the Chinese are coming back. And there are a lot of Chinese who are there either working or trading. There's a lot of paranoia among ethnic Russians about the future there. So the Chinese and the Russians always are working to try to get this. We have a relationship, the Shanghai organization, and we're going to cooperate. And you Americans, you better watch, and you better pay attention, because we're really getting together really big. But to some degree, both of them, neither of them trust the other enough for that to really work. And you have to remember, too, on energy, China is basically a consumer, and Russia is basically a producer. Their interests are not the same. Now, where they do see eye to eye is neither one wants a bunch of human rights NGOs and well-intentioned United Nations do-gooders coming around and talking about subjects like Chechnya or Tibet. Both countries have a list. And so on that, they very much see eye to eye. And I think we have to expect at the Security Council that there, they're, you know, they're going to be like southern states in the U.S. Senate before, before the abolition of slavery. You know, they're not going to vote for anything that ever looks like it could lead to the abolition of slavery. And, and that's just a fact of life. Um, I think that's probably, I'm, I'll have to take the last question uh, now, I think. Yeah? Professor Reed, uh, thank you for coming here and giving us uh, the, big, the terrific um, lecture about Asia. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think is holding back North Korean leader Kim Jong-un from pushing the red button? Thank you. I'm not sure he really wants to push the red button. For one thing, once he's pushed it, he can't push it again. Um, you know, I, North Korea looks to me an awful lot like, you know, you know the expression, a one-trick pony. You know, it's, or it's, it's got a one-crop economy. The only thing it can grow is nuclear weapons. And so every year it grows a new crop of nuclear weapons, and then it wants somebody to buy, like, okay, fine, you can buy the development rights, or, you know, you give me some famine aid, and I, they, they want to trade what they've got for what they want. You know, this is the one thing they've found 
that they know gets everybody's attention. No one pays any attention to anything else happening in North Korea other than nuclear weapons. I, when I visited there, they took me to a gift shop where you know, various North Korean products were on display. I looked a long time. I ended up buying the dead stuffed chipmunk that was nailed to a pine, a piece of pine wood, because that was the most interesting thing in the store. Um, they don't have a lot to sell. It's a great chipmunk, too. Uh, dead, very dead. Um, and, you know, so he's got, they, they, their goal is to keep up the threat, but without going over the threshold. Now, the thing is, he could get himself in a corner where he has to kind of follow through, but I don't think that's where they want to go. So we're going to wrap up this evening. I'd like to call on Vince Madro, the director of the Colin Powell Center, to say a few words. Well, before anything else, uh, I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking Walter Russell Mead for an exceptionally thought-provoking set of discussions. It has been our great pleasure and honor at the Colin Powell Center to work with Professor Menon to inaugurate this first Anne and Bernard Spitzer Lecture in International Security. It, 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 it's, a, it's a great honor for us to be able to do this. It is something we anticipate doing in perpetuity at City College, and, and so this is another way in which your tremendous gift to the college is going to keep on giving. So please join me in thanking the Spitzer family for their support. I would also like to take a second and, and thank Professor Menon himself for this. The, the, the Ann and Bernard Spitzer lecture was not uh, a necessary part of, of, of their generosity. And, and, and Raj, when he came to City College, said, as part of my professorship here, I want to be able to honor the sponsors of my position, honor City College, and provide an opportunity for City College students primarily to come together once a year and think um, hard about issues of pressing concern in international security. And so, Professor Menon, um, thank you so much for conceiving of this and executing it with us. And with that, I would like to um, close out the, uh, the inaugural lecture in this series. Please, if you're not graduating between now and next year, and even if you are, look for us next year um, for the second installation of this lecture. And thank you all for coming. Good night.